Okay, so this lecture is called Connection of Living Organisms. It's not a specific chapter in the book. It's pulling together the concepts that we've seen in the population ecology information and the community ecology information. This also can connect into the biomes and the conservation biology information. So it's, it's like a snapshot of all of those chapters and all those those areas of content combined into a basic application. So what I want you guys to think about, you know, if you play the game Chenga, everything is connected. We talked a little bit about this before with keystone species. All these blocks have a connection to other blocks. Some of them are direct connections, others are indirect connections. And what we want to look at is what happens if you influence one of those connections? How does that impact or ripple effect the other species that are connected to those blocks? Okay, so let's start with the base of any community. And we look at some abiotic factors like sunlight. Sunlight is non living, but that combined with the wind patterns, the amount of water, and things like the soil quality all help determine the diversity of producers within the community. So you can't grow plants if you don't have enough sunlight or if the pH of the soil is bad or if it's rocky, if you're in a very windy harsh environment, it's difficult for a producer base to get established. So those factors all combine to establish the producer base. Now the producers, these guys run photosynthesis. So through the process of photosynthesis, they will produce oxygen and sugar. All right, so sugar, carbohydrates, calories, energy, fruit, vegetables, etc. Now, the amount of energy that they produce can be measured. It's, it's tangible to measure the amount of energy. A lot of times it's represented as kilocalories of energy per square meter of producer base. So if I have 100 acres in the forest, how many calories or kilocalories will the forest be able to produce. There is a tangible number to this. Okay, so now that number determines the first level consumers, or what we call the herbivores. Now, the herbivores are only there if there are the right type of producers. So, pandas eat bamboo. We won't see a panda in Illinois, or in the United States for that matter, because we don't naturally have bamboo. Now, could we grow enough bamboo here to support a panda population? Possibly, but it would take a lot of bamboo, a big, big area of bamboo, to have the right kind of calories necessary for pandas and a population of pandas. Spider monkeys, down to the right there, they don't live in Illinois because we don't have the right type of fruit trees. You know, spider monkeys don't eat peaches and apples. That's not their natural diet. They have not evolved eating those things. This is why they are native to tropical environments, particularly Central and South America. Okay, so when we're looking at the producer base, the producer base establishes the foundation of the community, and that producer base is there only if the abiotic factors enable it to be there. Okay, so let's put it into a, a backyard example for some of us. If anybody has a rose bush, rose bushes are producers. Okay, they run photosynthesis. If you have a rose bush, a problem that you may come across are these little things called aphids. Now, <clears throat> the aphids are herbivores, they're going to eat your rose bush. A lot of times people spray chemicals on their rose bushes to get rid of the aphids. Kills the aphids, rose bushes are saved. But you could also get ladybugs. Ladybugs are carnivores. 
and they are particularly fond of eating aphids. So what we're looking at here, rose bushes being the producer, aphids being the herbivores, and ladybug as being the carnivores, is a food chain. You have three species. Now, is there something that would eat a ladybug? Oh, you better believe it. Right now, though, this food chain consists of three species. But a lot of times, we might step up one more level and go, okay, the spider catches the ladybug, eats the ladybug. And the ladybug had eaten the aphid, and the aphid had eaten the rosebush. So now we have a fourth level in our food chain. And those are what we call the secondary carnivores. And then sometimes we throw into the mix this group of animals known as omnivores. They will eat both producers and consumers. So producers being the plants, consumers being the things that eat the plants. So a robin is going to eat everything in that food chain. It will eat the ladybugs, it will eat the aphids, it will eat the spiders, it might even eat the rose bush, depending upon the type of buds and flowers being produced. Okay, so all these things are connected in your community. That's the connections I want us to see. So when we're talking about impacting a community or influencing one population, we want to keep in mind, how does that connect to other populations? All right, so the basis of all of this goes back to thermodynamics and energy. When we talk about food chains, there is a thing called the 10% rule of energy flow. 10% of the energy at a given level will move to the next level. Okay, so what this means, you start with a million joules of sunlight, and joules is a way to measure energy, kind of like calories, kilocalories, etc. Out of that million, 10,000 joules of energy will be absorbed by the producer base the sunflowers, the cone flowers, all these different flowers. So what you're literally doing is moving your decimal point over one. So knock off a zero. Okay, so we got 10,000 joules of energy at the producers. Out of that 10,000, only 1,000 makes it up to the herbivores, the primary consumers, or herbivores in this example, those herbivores being the grasshoppers. Okay, 10%. Move your decimal over one. Now, Think about it. The grasshopper doesn't eat the roots, it doesn't eat the leaves, it doesn't eat the stems, it eats some of the flower, some of the petal. It doesn't eat the entire plant. That's why it's only 10% that makes it to the grasshopper. Now the grasshopper, when that is eaten by that little mouse, only 10% of that energy gets up to the mouse, what we call the secondary consumer. Okay, so now you're down to 100 joules. 100 joules of energy. Is that enough to support a mouse? Probably not. So the mouse probably needs to eat five, six, seven grasshoppers to get enough calories in its diet to support it. But then the mouse, from the mouse to the snake, only 10 joules of energy make it up to the snake. Now that's definitely not enough food to support one snake. So that snake needs to eat a bunch of mice, the mice need to eat a bunch of grasshoppers, the grasshoppers need to eat a bunch of the plants, and there better be a huge field of these sunflowers to support that snake. So the snake is dependent upon the sunflowers because of the food chain, the connections there, how it consumes food. And let's say we have a bad year. It's a drought, not enough rainfall, soil quality is poor, and we don't get a lot of sunflowers, you may not have snakes because there's not enough sunflowers to support a big enough grasshopper population to support enough mice for the mice then to support the snakes. So it's amazing. All of these populations are connected and they're all intertwined with their interactions that when one population changes, goes up, the population goes down, it influences all of the others. Okay, so let's say for some reason 
we had a really good year for snake babies and there's a big increase in snake baby population so there's more snakes that means there's fewer mice because more snakes they're going to eat the mice there's fewer mice fewer mice around mean the grasshoppers go up because they're not being eaten more grasshoppers uh-oh that puts pressure on your producer population and that may go down so you see how that can ripple effect you know, let's let's put the arrows at a different level mouse population explodes so you're like oh wow they for whatever reason they were all producing close to biotic potential they had lots and lots of babies more mice more snakes but more mice fewer grasshoppers fewer plants or i'm sorry more plants because there's fewer grasshoppers let's get rid of that let's get going the right way okay so then the plant population goes up okay so can you look at these arrows because you change one arrow it changes all the other arrow directions it can cause some to go up some to go down that's the connection that we have in communities ecological communities okay so when we talk about a thing called a food chain here's the, the definition i want you guys to remember food chain is a linear pathway from one trophic level to the next these tend to be fairly short generally three to five species due to the 10 percent rule of energy energy transfer okay so that's the key 10 percent so if you looked at a population and said okay let's check out the energy level at the flowers here Okay, so let's say, just making up an easy number, there is 4,000 calories available at the flower level. That means the caterpillar level, there's going to be 400. They're going to do 400. Okay, the caterpillar gets eaten by the frog. That only puts 40 calories available at the frog. Frog's eaten by the snake, 4 calories at the snake level. And then the snake gets eaten by the owl, that's 0.4 calories available at the owl level. So just, just make up an example. To get 4,000 calories of food at the producer level here, maybe we need 2 acres of flowers, 2 acres of fields to give us 4,000 calories. So can an owl survive on 0.4 calories of food? Not at all. Not at all. So here's the kind of pulling the concepts together. Let's say the owl needs eight point zero calories a day to survive. And I'm just making up easy numbers. If he's only getting 0.4 calories from this food chain off of two acres, you look at that and go, well, wait a minute. That owl needs a whole lot of acres in order for it to survive. So if he needs eight calories, he needs to do this food chain, think about it, 200 times? No, that's too many. 20 times. So 20 times 0.4 gives that owl its eight calories but 20 of these food chains means that that owl needs 20 two acre plots in order to find enough food so that owl will need 40 acres of territory for its food source this is why top level species top level predators have to have large territories. You cannot have a top-level carnivore survive in a very small community. So we'll keep thinking about this as we talk about conservation biology. But we're going to get into how these food chains connect together in the food webs in our next lecture here.